Hi, I'm Darren, and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. In today's episode, I'll be building this cute little RF power tap. An RF power tap is an essential lab accessory for accurately sampling a transmitter's output. I'll show you the calculations behind how it works, and I'll build one from scratch using a well known and solid design. The source of this idea comes from a June 2001 QST article titled Simple RF Power Measurement. It was written by Wes Hayward, amateur call sign W7ZOI, and Bob Larkin, amateur call sign W7PUA. Now the main focus of the article is actually how to build this RF power meter. And as you can see, I've done the project and built this meter, and it's one of the most useful projects I have in my lab. The one limitation it has though, it can't measure signals above 10 or plus 10 dBm. So in order to use it or any other instrument at higher power, you need an RF power tap. Performance parameters on this RF power tap are fairly straightforward. It provides 40 dB of attenuation. So for example, using it with a 100 watt transmitter, which is plus 50 dBm, it'll have a tap signal at plus 10 dBm, and that'll work just fine with the power meter and also with the spectrum analyzer that I built a few months ago. Now, as we'll see here in a few minutes, constructing this is pretty simple. It didn't take me very long at all to put this together. And here's why construction goes so fast. The parts count is really simple. Three connectors, four resistors, and an enclosure, plus a brass strip that I'll talk about later. Now, because this device contains strong RF signals, you need to use a metal enclosure, not a plastic one. And here I'm using a Hammond 1590A die-cast aluminum box as recommended in the article. These Hammond boxes are great to work with. They drill and machine very easily and the included cover securely attaches to the box. You'll need three connectors. So for my version I'm using two SO239 bulkhead connectors and one BNC female connector. I chose those because my intended applications are mostly going to be with HF gear. The design is sufficiently accurate up to about 500 megahertz. So you could use end connectors or all BNC if that's your preference. Before I get into the construction, I want to take a few minutes to go over how it works. So I've put together this illustration. The power tap connects between a transmitter or other RF power source and a load, in this case a dummy load. You could use a properly tuned antenna instead of a dummy load if, for example, you were wanting to measure transmitted power while on the air, but of course you'd have to follow the applicable FCC rules for transmitting. Here's where the brass strip goes that I mentioned earlier. It makes a low impedance connection between the two SO239 connectors. Next there are four resistors that make up a voltage divider network from the brass strip to ground. Three are in series to spread out the power dissipation and split the voltage drop. The fourth, R2, is set to match the impedance of the power meter and other measuring devices, which typically are 50 ohms. You can ignore that capacitor for now. It's used to negate higher frequency effects and I'll show it later. Now note that the power tap is in parallel with the dummy load, but its impedance is high enough to not have a significant effect on what the transmitter sees for total connected impedance. And if you are inclined to learn the math behind how the resistor values are calculated, I'm showing that here as well. The top portion of the screen shows the equations, and the right side shows them plugged into an Excel spreadsheet. Just for interest, I've included three values of attenuation. The version I'm building is 40 dB, but I'm also showing the resistor values needed for 30 dB and for 50 dB. The steps in the math begin with an assumption that the power dissipated at the dummy load is equal to the transmitter power. That isn't exact because there will be some power loss in the power tap, but it doesn't matter. The math still works out close enough. Next, I'm assuming a transmitter power of 100 watts. You could use any value, but 100 watts makes the numbers easy to work with. Also, I've combined the three series resistors between the brass strip and R2 into a single value R1, which is fine for the purpose of doing the math. It doesn't matter how many there are in series here, they just add up all together to R1. Now steps 4 through 7 show the rest of the math. I'm not going to go through it in detail. You can pause the video and study it by yourself if you wish. But essentially it uses Ohm's law, the power equation P equals V squared over R, and the equation for a voltage divider to solve for R1. In this case for 40 dB of attenuation, R1 equals about 2.4K. In the Excel table I've typed in those equations. I've also updated them to include the effect of power dissipated in the power tap. 
Now that made the math a bit more complex, but I did that mostly so I could understand the power R1 would have to handle. I also rounded R1 to use series combinations of off-the-shelf resistors. In the case of the 40 dB configuration, I'm showing 2,460 ohms, which is the three 820 ohm resistors in series specified in the QST article. So for 30 dB of attenuation, you can use 750 ohms for R1, which you can get from two 240 ohm resistors and one 270 ohm resistor. For 50 dB of attenuation, it's 7.8 K, which can be done with two 2.7 K resistors and one 2.4 K resistor. Lastly, see the power dissipated here for R1. It's a bit of a concern for the 40 dB version because I'm using half watt resistors and will be putting almost two watts through them. So for sure this power tap wouldn't handle a 100 watt transmitter indefinitely, but the actual duty cycle when I'm using it will be much shorter, so using these half watt resistors should be just fine. The 50 dB version is no concern. The power dissipated by R1 is just over half a watt. It's a different story though for the 30 dB version. R1 needs to handle almost 6 watts. So using half watt resistors here is not a good idea. You need bigger ones for sure, but remember, don't use wire wound resistors in RF circuits. They have significant inductance that will cause undesirable reactances. Alright now, time to build this thing. First item to make is this brass strip bus bar that connects the two SO239 connectors. And it needs to be an inch wide and 1.5 inches long. Note that the two corners need to be chamfered to clear the screw bosses in the aluminum housing. It's RF hot, so it has to clear the housing all around. You could use a piece of brass scrap, but I didn't happen to have a piece, so I bought this foot-long piece at the hardware store. It's 32 thousandths thick, so it cuts easily with a pair of regular tin snips. To improve solderability, I tin plated it using the liquid tin method I've shown in a prior video. This works very well and makes a piece like this a heck of a lot easier to solder. Next up was to machine the housing for the three connectors. This is pretty fast to do with a drill press and a step drill to make the larger holes. Like I said earlier, this die cast aluminum cuts easily and cleanly. And here's the finished mechanical assembly with the three connectors installed. The BNC came with its own mounting hardware, but I had to scrounge around to find eight sets of number four hardware for the two SO239 connectors. The connectors barely fit to the height of the housing. In fact, I had to file down the flats in the lower row of nuts to get them to fit. Another issue was, the lip on the cover interfered with the top row of nuts, but that was an easy fix. I just used my small vertical mill to cut a relief in that lip for clearance. The brass strip is held in place just by soldering it to the SO239 connectors. It soldered pretty easily, but notice that I used a liberal amount of SA flux. I also needed something to wedge it up in position during soldering, and a wadded up piece of paper shoved underneath it did the trick. The rest of the soldering goes fast, and here's the finished assembly after I removed the flux using lacquer thinner. That blue piece of wire? That's the capacitor I mentioned earlier. It literally is just a 0.6 inch length of number 22 wire soldered to the brass strip. It runs parallel to the resistors. This is what the article states to use to improve the high frequency response, and I believe this is what the old timers would call a gimmick capacitor. I do see a weakness to this design. The only thing that holds the brass strip in place are the connector solder joints, and that means it will move whenever the center pins of the connectors rotate. That puts bending stresses on the resistors, and I don't think they will take much of that before breaking. So I'll think about a fix for that. The resistance from the BNC connector to ground should be 50 ohms, and it is. And the resistance from the brass strip to ground, which is all four resistors in series, should be 2.51K, and it measures 2.47K. That's within a couple percent, which jives with the 5% resistors I used, so we're good to go. And now to make some bling, I designed some graphics in PowerPoint for the cover and then inkjet printed them on water slide decal paper. I printed three copies so I'd have some extras in case I ruined one. Now it's critical that you seal the ink before you submerge the decals in water, otherwise the ink will just wash away. I'm using a clear acrylic spray paint to do the job. Three light coats with about five minutes dry time between will do the trick. After the acrylic dries for at least a couple of hours, I can do the transfer. This part is easy. It's just like putting decals on a model kit car when you were a kid. You soak the decal in water for a minute or so to get it to separate from the backing paper, and then gently place it on the surface. Oh, and you need to lightly wet the surface first to make sure you've got a thin film of water to make it easy to slide the decal around and get it positioned where you want it. I start smoothing it out gently with my finger. That'll squeeze out the excess water. Then you can use a cotton swab to finish the job. 
Be sure to let it dry overnight and then, and here's another critical step, spray three light coats of acrylic over the surface. That helps bond the decal more permanently to the aluminum and makes the edges more resistant to curling up and also provides some additional scratch resistance. I'd have to say I am happy with how this turned out. Doing this water slip decal method is pretty easy. All you need is just a regular inkjet printer, make some graphics and PowerPoint like I did here, and it turns out nice. Now the overall durability is a bit of a concern because this is just acrylic overcoat on the top, and acrylic is not the best uh, polymer for resistance to chemicals, so just about any solvent is gonna damage this, so you gotta be careful. But other than that, I mean, the quality of the graphics is really good, and I wanted to show this too. This is the Carlson Super Probe that I made about a year ago, and for it, I did the same technique. I made some graphics in PowerPoint, printed them out and bonded them on the, the, the top with uh, that top layer of acrylic to help protect it. And then also on the front panel of the device too, it's same same technique. So it does look nice, it's pretty easy to do. But like I said, the durability is a bit of a, a question. And maybe in the future what I'll do is experiment with maybe polyurethane or um, enamel clear coat and see if that does any better. All right, I'm back in the lab. And I've connected the power tap up to a couple pieces of equipment here so we can see it actually work. And it's going to be a bit noisy because the cooling fan on my HP signal generator does make a bit of a racket. And I've had to put my uh, lapel mic on so that further degrades the audio. But nonetheless, I think um, it'll still come through okay. So I'm going to move the camera around here a bit to show how this is connected. And over here on the left... Here's the signal generator, and I have it set for 10 megahertz, but it's currently set with its output off. Uh, in a minute, I will turn it on to plus 10 dBm. So the output goes through the cable into the power tap and then straight through to the other side to that cylindrical finned object. That's the dummy load. And then off the bottom of the power tap goes into my power meter, and there is a port on there. It's actually a uh, feed-through capacitor that I've connected the multimeter to and right now it's measuring 1.24 volts give or take. So that's just background very low level RF that's still being picked up by the power meter. It's pretty sensitive and the reason I've connected the meter to it is the analog meter on the front is not very accurate uh, for these measurements. It's really intended to be used for peaking and by connecting uh, the multimeter I'll be able to get a more accurate reading. And taking that value, I actually have a table that I've made, and I think what I'll do, I'll just cut in a separate slide to show that as I'm describing it, because this is probably not going to come through very clear on the video. But what this is, is the calibration that I did back when I made that meter to know what the output voltage is versus the power input in dBm. So when we get a reading on the meter, I'll be able to tell by looking at that conversion table just what the, the power strength is. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and turn the signal generator on to plus 10 dBm and we'll see the meter jump up. And we're seeing about 3.51 volts coming through. Now using that conversion table, the function that I uh, used to uh, create that table is 16.1 times the multimeter reading in volts uh, minus 85.7. So that's just a straight line equation through those numbers. And if you do the math with 3.51 volts, that comes out to 29, I'm sorry, negative 29.2 dBm. So I've got plus 10 dBm going into the power tap and I'm sampling negative 29.2 or almost negative 30 dBm. And that is really good. That's the 40 dB drop that I expected. Next I'm going to do a higher power test and what I've done is taken my Kenwood amateur radio transceiver here and because I can't transmit at anything other than amateur radio frequencies I've set it to 14.025 14 14 megahertz. Um, I've also dialed down the power. Um, it will transmit up to 100 watts in CW mode, I just set the internal setting to 50 watts just to reduce the loading of my dummy load. Now the dummy load is still here, it's in the back, and it will handle 100 watts, but only intermittently, and I didn't see the need to, to really push it too far. The rest of the connections are still the same. I got the multimeter connected up to the power meter, and then there's the, there's the RF power tap right here. So what I've done is run the calculation. So at 50 watts of output power, that's plus 47 dBm, give or take. And with a 40 dB drop in the power tap, I would expect there to be five, 
uh, 0.76 volts on the meter here. And the way that that's calculated, 47 dB reduced by 40, knocks it down to 7 dBm, plus 7 dBm. And then running through that table I showed uh, a few moments ago with the formula, back calculates to 5.76 volts. So I'm going to key the transmitter, and we'll, we'll see it go here. 5.78 volts, that's pretty good. That's about where we'd expect it to be. So the RF power tap is working at higher power within the expected range. So that's all there is to it to make an RF power tap. They are pretty simple, easy, and quick to make, and they're handy to have around the lab, especially if you're like me where you are testing transmitters every now and then and want to get a low power signal out for running through a spectrum analyzer or a power meter. Now, in today's video, uh, there was a bit of a guest star. You probably heard occasionally the cicadas in the background. Just a natural fact of life where I live. This time of year, they're just so loud. And there's only about an hour or two each day in my lab where I could find time where they're even quiet. So uh, today just wasn't one of those days. So I decided to just carry on and get the video done anyway. So I hope you liked the video. Uh, if you did, please like the uh, click the like button below and leave some comments if you have any questions. And for sure, if you're not already a subscriber, I would appreciate it if you would subscribe and get those automatic updates every time I put out a new video. So until next time, bye for now.